So a lot of things we don't know, and the older I get and the more I learn, the more I think I understand, the less I know. But we do know a few things. We do know that God's love is real, and we do know that God raised Jesus from the dead, and that our Redeemer lives. And so what we're doing uh, this morning on a Sunday, we could be doing a lot of other things, but we're doing what we're doing because um, He lives, and because that actually makes a difference, a real uh, practical difference in our lives today. And so we're not putting on airs, we're not pretending, we're not doing this because it's merely tradition, we're doing this because it's real, it's real. I want to read um, from the book of Ephesians. Our text this morning is going to be Ephesians chapter 3. One of the great um, benefits we have of Jesus being raised from the dead, giving us life, and this, uh, this, this Bible being written to us and instructing us is this avenue of prayer that we have, that we've been exercising today, speaking to God through the name Uh, and through the life of Jesus. Uh, I'd like to read Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 14, all the way to verse 21. This is going to be our text we're going to uh, preach from this morning. Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory... He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. How did you learn how to pray? If you grew up reading maybe a King James translation of the Bible, you might pray like this, I beseech thee, Almighty Father. Because you associate approaching God in a reverent way with Elizabethan English. That's fine. That's how you learned it, right? That's how you grew up. Or maybe that's how your dad prayed, uh, you know, as he was leading the family at home. My point is, whatever your background you're going to use vernacular that's familiar to you, that's familiar to your generation, your culture, your surroundings. We all pray a little bit differently, but we all learn how to pray by imitation. Now, prayer by imitation is okay if you choose who you imitate well, right? And I think we need, uh, as as men in in this congregation, we need to uh, take that to heart that when we're praying, there are other people listening that are formulating their understanding of prayer by hearing how how we pray in the assembly. So prayer is instructive. Prayer is educational. The best public prayers are the ones that we find in Scripture. There's beautiful prayers all over the Bible. Prayers of Moses in the Old Testament. Prayers of David and, and, and Solomon. Prayers of Daniel and Nehemiah. Of course, Prayers of Jesus are the best. One of my favorites is right here, the one that we just read in Ephesians chapter 3, and it's a prayer for power. It's a prayer of power as well. And so what we're going to do is just walk through this text very carefully, and let's uh, allow the Apostle Paul to teach us a thing or two about God, about ourselves, and also about how to pray, how to pray. First of all, what is the basis for Paul's prayer? Verses 14 and 15, we ought to be addressing God, number one, for what God has done and who He is. Address God for what He has done and who He is. Do you see that in verse 14? He says, for this reason. For what reason, Paul? 
Well, he says in verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. In other words, look at what Paul was writing about earlier on in the book. Look at the, the wonderful things that God has been up to from before the foundation of the world. How God has been acting to achieve His eternal purpose. How God has been saving humanity. How He's been drawing people from diverse backgrounds. As Paul puts it, Jews and Gentiles. But here in D.C., it's people from all walks of life. He's still doing it today. Look at what God is doing. And be amazed by what God is doing. And for that reason, go to Him in prayer. He is rescuing us. He is reconciling us. He's redeeming lost humanity. So you pray on the basis of what He has done, on His ability, and you pray on the basis of who He is. Do you see in verse 15 how Paul speaks of God as the Father of all fathers, the ultimate archetypal Father. All fatherhood derives its definition and meaning from the fatherhood of God. No one illustrated the father-son relationship better than Jesus, the very Son of God. When he was, in fact, when he was teaching us how to pray, he said, don't pray like the pagans do. They heap up all of these phrases. They think that their gods will hear them you know, just by speaking more and saying more and saying more. Don't pray like that. He says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He goes on in Matthew chapter 7 and, and continues to, to speak on this idea of approaching God as a father. He says, you know how you love your children and you give good gifts to your children? If you, being earthly, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, what do you think about God, your heavenly father? You think if you knock on his door and you say, God, I need this, that he's going to He's going to give you something evil? Do you think that you say, God, I'm hungry. You think he's going to give you a lump of coal or a, or a rock to, to chew on? No, God loves you. He wants to provide for you. And so you go to your, your heavenly Father. He who seeks will find. He who knocks, it will be open to him. Our Father, or our prayers should be motivated by the character of God and by the activity of of our loving Father, we address Him because He's able to answer our prayers, and as a Father, He's actually willing to answer our prayers. And so that's the basis. Well, what is the petition? What is Paul praying for? He makes two petitions. The first one is this, in verse 16, may God strengthen our inner being with power. Do you see that in verse 16? May God strengthen our inner being with power. You know what Paul said before in Ephesians chapter 2, he says that we used to be under the power of a different one. We used to be following the prince of the power of the air, that is the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. But God's power, the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead, is at work in believers. He said that in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 18, 19, and 20. He says, to have our eyes of our hearts enlightened that you may, be, may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. The same power, in other words, that raised Jesus from the dead, God wants to put at work in your life. Now, that is a difficult concept to, to really wrap your minds around, but so it is. God wants to empower you. He wants you to go and take the fight to the devil, which is what Paul goes on to say in chapter 6. That same resurrection power God wants you to have so that when you die to sin, you are raised to walk in newness of life, in the life of Christ, in the power of Christ. Paul's prayer is, is that the Ephesians, and by extension you and I, thousands of years later, could tap into that power source, that resurrection power source. And you see that the agent who mediates God's power is His Spirit. Is His Spirit. Verse 16, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. The Spirit is the agent of God's power. Now, Jesus... When he came, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, Peter said in Acts chapter five or 10. 
And when Jesus ascended, He sent the Holy Spirit down to imbue the apostles with with, uh, miraculous power so that they can be His witnesses and proclaim the gospel. And yes, I might not be able to raise the dead. I might not be able to heal the sick today. But we have the power of the Spirit because the Spirit also inspired this Word. And so the Spirit is active in your life as we take on this Word in our lives and we assimilate it into ourselves. He's giving you that resurrection power, the Spirit, through this Word. And God can grant this prayer for power because He Himself is all-powerful. He gives us strength, verse 16 says, according to the riches of His glory. That is, His abundant, overflowing wealth. He's so rich with glory. He's so rich with power. And He's already done so in in Jesus. Our very first Sunday together, I preach from Ephesians chapter 1 and how God's great power is at work within us and how He's granted us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And He's saved us from our sins because He's rich in mercy and He's rich in love towards us. And He lavishes us, as he puts it in chapter 2, in extravagant, prodigal ways, and he'll never, ever run out of the power to give to us. In the sphere of operation of God's power, do you see where all of this is taking place in verse 16? It's in your inner being. It's in your inner being. That is who you are. Your soul, your identity, it's what remains of us after we die and our bodies return to the dust of the earth. That's the part that we ought to be praying that God would strengthen, brethren. That's the part that Paul was praying that God would strengthen the Ephesians. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our outer man wastes away. We're fighting an uphill battle here. Our outer man is wasting away, but our inner man is being renewed day by day as we're living by faith in God's Word. And if the inner man, if we're praying for the inner man to be equipped with power, then we can handle all of the outward difficulties of life. Now, let me ask you, does your prayer life reflect that? What are we more focused on? When we go to God in prayer and when we're trying to tap into this resurrection power, this unlimited power of God, usually we're too focused on the outer man when we ought to be praying biblically and praying for God to strengthen our inner person. That is the priority so we can deal with those outward difficulties uh, that we come across in life. So what is the purpose? Why should we be praying this kind of prayer for power? Well, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, verse 17. That's the goal here. You say, well, wait a minute. Aren't these people Christians? You know, shouldn't Christ already dwell in our hearts? I think dwell is a particularly strong word. It means that Christ would take up residence, that he would establish himself within your hearts. The best I can come to explaining this is how you move into a house. Rachel and I, our first house, was in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, and it was what you would call a fixer-upper, um, and it was a complete, it wasn't a complete mess. It had good bones, it had good bones, but there was a lot of stuff that needed to be taken care of. So we moved in, and then we began to dwell. <laughs> All right, we moved in, and we went through the process of de right? There were the, the awnings, that uh, were on all the windows that just made the house really dark, and they were green and yellow striped awnings. We had to take those off. We had to landscape the entire property because it looked like it was from the 1960s. Do new flooring. Plum- the, 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 the plumbing had to be ripped out and, and put in new. The electrical wasn't up the code. It was knob and tube electrical from like 100 years ago. That had to be taken out. The garage, the kitchen, all of that had to be redone. And in the end, it looked like a very different house than the one that we bought. Why? Because we took up our residence. Because we began to dwell there. Because we began to to nest. Our presence was firmly established there. And you could see it because it looked different. That's the way it is with Jesus. Right? He moves in, so to speak, when we become 
God's child. When we're baptized, Jesus is moving into our lives, and he's got a great deal of work to do, right? Because our life looks a lot like that fixer-upper. It's broken down. It's out of date. It's ugly. It's smelly. It's dangerous. But Jesus, through the power of the Spirit and the Word here, he can break down those walls. He can begin to renovate. He can make it, as Paul says in chapter 2, his holy habitation so that Christ would dwell in your hearts. But it's through faith. That power that's at work, that power that raised Jesus from the dead, it's not just about cleansing us from sin. It's not just about ripping down the awnings and taking out the bushes from the 1960s. It's not a once and done thing. It's a process of transformation. As Paul goes on to say in chapter 4, it's putting off the old man being renewed in the spirit of your minds and putting on the new man who is made in the image, remade, recreated in the image of the one who made it. Jesus only takes up residence in our lives to renovate us and to remodel us. Paul says, through faith. That's the condition. In other words, this is a two-way street. He's not going to barge in. He's not going to make himself known and just uh, against your will uh, start, start tearing out the plumbing in your life. That's a bad metaphor, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, He's not going to, to do that uninvited. The way that the book of Revelation talks about it is Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. He's, he's knocking, but he's waiting for you to answer. He's waiting for you to invite him in. And Paul says we do that on the condition of faith and our trust in him. Faith in Jesus, inviting him into your life. There's a second petition in the latter part of verse 17 through 19. May God help us grasp the limitless dimensions of his love. May God help us grasp the limitless dimensions of his love. Paul said already in this book in chapter 1 that God's love for us is eternal. That he even loved us before the foundation of the world. Before he set his plan into motion, he loved us. Before creation had been established, God loved us. And God's children today are supposed to be rooted and established in that eternal love of God. Just like a seed that's planted in soil. Paul's prayer is that we would continue to grow in the soil of God's eternal love. Our roots would go deep and receive the nutrients from God's love from beneath but our limbs would be outstretched toward God in prayer and that we can grow and flourish in our understanding and our appreciation of His love. Now, notice Paul's prayer here in verse 17 is not that we would love God more. That would be a good prayer. But his prayer is not that we would love God more. His prayer is that we would know God's love for us more, which would cause us in turn to love Him more and more. And so how do you measure God's love? Do you measure it in acres? Do you measure it in light years? Do you measure it in gallons or, 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 or feet or tons? And so what Paul does here is he begins with all these linear dimensions, length, height, and depth, and, and, and breadth. But then he uses this paradox in verse 19, that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. How can I know something that surpasses knowledge? God's love is so fathomless, it's so limitless, that to fully know God's love would be to go beyond what our brains can handle, what mere knowledge can teach us. So God's love is something that outstrips the mind. Knowing God's love on a page, being able to quote John 3.16 or something like that, is one thing, but to experience it yourself is quite another. And we grasp God's love not only through knowledge, but through experience. And that's why, as David prayed, that we, so much of our love for God is worked out in our love for one another, right? It's something that we have to experience. We can't just read it in a book. We've got to go and put it into action in our lives. So what's the purpose of this petition? May God help us grant, uh, grasp the limitless dimensions of his love. Why? So that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, I know this isn't explicit in the text, but I think it's clearly implied 
That if we're meant to be filled up, then we're incomplete without it. That we're deficient. God has created all human beings. He's created you as a vessel to be filled up to fullness. But what we've done apart from God is tr- attempted to, to fill our lives with all sorts of meaningless things, all sorts of garbage. And the more we dump into our lives, we think that we're going to be full when we have a family. We think that we're going to be full when we get the job that we want. We think that we're going to be full when we get this house or we get this car or whatever it is. We think that we're going to be full, but really we end up feeling just empty inside. And it's only when we're filled up by God and with God that we're full and that we're complete. And the more we grasp the limitless dimensions of God's love in Christ, the more full and the more complete we're going to become. And we can never grasp, we can never grasp the limitless dimensions of God's love alone. You can't do it. Yes, there is a sense in which your faith is between you and God. We understand that. But there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. There's just not. You can't do it alone. Right? God has baked into our faith the importance of community, of church relationships. Do you notice what he said in verse 18? He's talking about the limitless dimensions of God's love. He says that we would comprehend it with ourselves, by ourselves. No, with all the saints, he says. Because God's love outstrips knowledge, there are aspects of love that we can't tap into by ourselves. And so we come to a greater understanding of it when there's a give and take. When I can, I can, I can receive that love of God and I can go to work tomorrow and I can actually put it into action. Or I can uh, spend time with a brother or sister in Christ and I can express God's love and show that it is at work in my life to them with forgiveness, with mercy, with patience, with service. And then in that practice, I'm comprehending God's love all the more. There's a wonderful song called The Love of God, and the third verse says, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Now, we're never going to grasp the fullness of that if we're not putting it into action in this church community and helping other people to see God's love through ourselves. See, children can't grow, they can't become mature. They can grow up in, in stature. They can, they can be a, have an adult body, but they're never going to be mature if they never experience the generous and disciplined love within a family. And God knows that we all need that, and that's why He's made us part of a family. And it's called the church. And Paul talks about the church in chapter 4 and how he's given gifts to the church so that they would become more mature and complete and resemble Christ more and more. And so the prayer is for all the saints to know God's love, not just intellectually, but to know God's love experientially. To be able to say with with David and, and, and Peter later on quotes this passage from Psalms to taste and see that the Lord is good. That's different, right? Or as Paul said, yes, it's one thing that, to say Christ died for sinners, but to, to say that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, who died for me and loved me to make that personal. There are a lot of people that are filled up with all sorts of knowledge, and they have all sorts of degrees, and they might even be theological degrees, but they're so immature spiritually because they're not part of a church where they can exercise that gift of God's love. That's what we need to be about here. That's God's will for the church in Dulles. We love one another, and that we would grasp the limitless dimensions of God's love. And finally, finally, the doxology. Glory be to Him who is infinitely capable. He ends this prayer by focusing attention on the smallness of our imagination in comparison with the cosmic vastness of God's ability. Oh, you think 
You think you know what God can do. <laughs> what does he say in verse 12? Oh, he's able to do far more abundantly, heaping on all of these superlatives, right? Than all we ask or think. So we lack imagination in what God is able to do in our lives. We are praying to a God who is so far above the farthest reaches of our minds to remove all doubt of His ability to grant our request. Yes, God can, can, can do marvelous things in our lives. Now, I've made the comment before, with omnipotence, there are no degrees of difficulty. You know, God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. There's, there's nowhere to go from there. He can grant your request. Behold, I am the Lord, Jeremiah says. The God of all flesh is anything too hard for me. When God said that Sarah would have a baby and she was in her 90s, she laughed. You remember? This is anything too hard for God? Really? He created the universe. He can make you pregnant, right? He can, he can cause a miracle to happen in your womb. We're praying to an unlimited God. We ought not to forget that when we go to God and when we're asking things of Him. Remember that great power that Paul was praying for, that power by which God grants our prayers? Where does he say it's working? It's at work within us. And that is the greatness of the gospel, is that this all-powerful God would partner with us, would cooperate with us, would put his power to work in our own lives. And the end of the prayer is for God's glory. The end of the prayer is for God's purposes. It's for God's pleasure. When God grants our prayers for that divine strength, when He's working mightily in our lives, when He's working in you to be a good husband, when He's working in you to be a good wife or a good mom, when He's working in you at the workplace, when you're showing mercy, when you are being a servant, when He's working in you in all of these seemingly insignificant ways, He is glorified. His purposes are being fulfilled. Lord, teach us to pray. When was the last time that you prayed like this? That you prayed like, like the Apostle Paul? You know, there was a, a poor farmer he spent all of his money buying this property, and he had grand visions of being able to provide for his family by, uh, you know, harvesting and selling a crop. And the first couple of years were rough. He had to put in a bunch of money to buy all this farming equipment and all that. The weather didn't, you know, cooperate with him. Uh, he was constantly fighting with broken down machinery and all this, and two or three or four years in, this guy is destitute. He's living in squalor. He has barely enough to feed his family. And finally, one year, he's ready to hang it up. He's ready to give up. There's a prospector who comes in from an oil company, and he does uh, a survey on his property, and he finds out all that time there was an oil reserve underneath his property, and that man became so wealthy. But all that time, he was living on top of that richness. He was living on top of that great wealth. That power was just beneath him. I think that's a metaphor for, for ourselves sometimes. We don't tap into that power that God desperately wants to activate in our lives. We can do so. If you're a Christian, you can do so through the avenue of prayer, going to God through Jesus, addressing him based upon what he's done for you and who he is. He's your father. He wants to hear from you. Pray to him. Pray like Paul. Pray this prayer when you go home, and God will grant your request. The condition is that he works through faith. So you're going to have to trust him. You're going to have to follow what he's teaching you in his word. Brethren, I really appreciate your, your attention through the lesson. And at the end, I just want to extend an invitation for anyone who's not a Christian. We always want to end with uh, a period of reflection upon our own lives, and uh, if you realize that your life isn't right with God for whatever reason, and you've got questions about how to get right with God, we can talk about that. So we're going to sing this song. Adam's going to lead us in this song.
And while we're singing this song, uh, see how these words apply to you and take stock of your own life. You can have a lot of things right in your life, but if your relationship with God isn't right, nothing is going to make sense. You're always going to feel empty inside, and God would have you be full. He wants to fill you up to all the fullness of God, as Paul said. If you'd like to become a Christian or you need the prayers of this church in any way, just come forward as we stand and sing this song.